a giant by the name of Tom Cribb. Cribb was very good. All one can say, I think, with a, a fair amount of certainty, is that modern heavyweights wouldn't stand much chance. It's, it's a question of the hands. Cribb could punch the bark off a tree. And then just think about that. I mean, his, his knuckles were so hard that there was a sort of horny covering on them, apparently. At 14 stone and almost six feet tall, Cribb was a man mountain by the standards of the day. He was a Bristol docker who'd been hauling coal on river barges since the age of nine. Then he'd served against Napoleon in the Royal Navy. The boxing fraternity couldn't get enough of him. The great thing about him was he would not quit. Cribb wouldn't give in, ever. And that, I think, is what they admired about him. He's a sort of John Bull figure, that he, he uh, embodied all the, the English virtues. Um, steady, strong, resolute, and never surrender. In January 1805, Bill went to see Cribb take on one George Maddox, a prize fighter renowned for his powers of resilience. Maddox was beaten to within an inch of his life. You know, they call it the science, they call it the fancy, they call it the art. A lot of the fights were just very, very brutal, slugging it out until one guy dropped down, sometimes dead, in a society where that would mean the absolute impoverishment of his family. Lord Camelford thought it suicide for Bill to even enter a ring with Cribb. His man was 16 years older and more than three stone lighter. It was one gamble Camelford wasn't prepared to take. But in 1805, Camelford's wild ways caught up with him. He got himself killed in a duel of honor. To some boxers, it would have been a disaster. But for Bill, it was the perfect opportunity to renegotiate. With London's top promoters chasing him, Bill was now able to set himself up with a juicy payday against the champion-in-waiting, Tom Cribb. Richmond is entitled to a unique niche among the heroes of the milling art as a practical and as a theoretical pugilist. His knowledge is all intuitive, having never received lessons from the professors. In the ring, he is considered to excel most other pugilists in the art of hitting and getting away. But Cribb, Tom Cribb. The only thing we had ever trained was a poodle. The act was getting so big that we needed a third person. The three of us, we became lovers. It was just something that happened that was beautiful. I almost think like it never happened, like it was a dream. I don't want to remember how it all ended. The bizarre story of how fate tore apart the cat dancers. Two Feels good, eh? Yeah. Watch Hugh Fernley Whittingstall take on Britain's top foodies. The Big Food Fight, Tuesday at 10 on 4. In October 1805, Admiral Nelson's fleet sailed for the Cape of Trafalgar to fight Napoleon's navy. It was to be one of the most crucial conflicts Britain had ever faced. But back in London, a very different battle was grabbing the headlines. A Richmond crib fight took up far more column inches in the paper than the sailing of Nelson's fleet. The fact that Nelson was about to close on the French-Spanish fleet at Trafalgar may have got a little notice here and a little notice there, whereas the build-up to the fight, there would have been all sorts of stuff. People writing about the training, how many people were expected to turn up, where it was to be. The inns for miles around were packed with people. A few minutes before 12 o'clock on the 8th of October, 10,000 people watched and waited 
as Bill threw his hat into the ring in the customary challenge. It was showtime. Richmond is hitting and retreating neatly. Crib tries to close. Oh, Crib is furious. He's following Richmond round the ring, but he can't seem to find his opponent. Richmond was lighter, quicker, agile, clearly much more athletic. One thing he knew against men who were younger, bigger and heavier was not to stand there and uh, to be hit. Um, he knew how to use his feet and he knew how to get out of trouble. He was accused when he used that tactic against Crib of um, acting like a clown, uh, skipping out of way, avoiding the blows and, and not being hit. And, and Crib couldn't put a, um, a fist on him. The embarrassment um, to, um, to Crib of not being able to land a punch um, for a very, very long time um, really niggled him. The two men clearly disliked each other. The man of colour is all alive. He's cutting more capers than a chef preparing a sauce for a leg of mutton. For 20 minutes, Bill danced his way round the bigger man. And after 18 rounds, it seemed the impossible was about to happen. And Crip is down! Crip is down! When a fighter was on the ground, then the round was stopped. There was an interval, 30-second interval, and then after 30 seconds, they came back and started all over again. And the fight only ended when one fighter couldn't be brought back to scratch. Bill produced a virtuoso display of pugilism. But with a knockout the only way to end a fight, Bill's size started to find him out. After one and a half hours of battering, Crib's extra weight began to tell. Richmond's knuckles are lacerated miserably. His features are disfigured. The man of color cannot possibly win. In 60 punishing rounds, the Black Terror had been beaten. But he wasn't finished yet. Bill had calculated shrewdly. His sheer audacity in taking on a man like Crib was the perfect way to win friends and influence people. The contest cemented Bill's reputation as a technically brilliant boxer. Now it was time to cash in. Bill knew his best years in the ring were behind him, so he hatched a new plan to create London's first public boxing academy. Richmond was obviously somebody with a, a lot of drive and a lot of ambition. Uh, he could have easily retired on the proceeds of his long career as a boxer. His social status was no doubt increased by, uh, by running this academy. You know, it gave him, it gave him um, a position in society. It becomes one of the sort of fashionable things. I suppose like, you know, these days everybody's doing sweat yoga or something. Those days, if you're really, really posh, you would go and do a couple of rounds in Bill's Boxing Academy. The fact that he was black um, meant that um, there was this kind of certain excitement of social cachet in going to be trained by him. The Academy was a runaway success. Gents flocked to Richmond's rooms to spot potential talent for the prize ring and to bask in the reflected glow of Bill Stardom. Bill had a dozen members of parliament on his books. Even the poet Lord Byron enjoyed a bit of punishment. Richmond's decision to open this um, 